This episode of Messed Up Origins is brought to you by Raycon. Top of the morning to you, Solo fam. My name is John Solo, and in honor of St. Patrick's Day being this week, we're tracing the origins of the holiday's mascot and essentially the mascot of Ireland, Conor McGregor. I mean, the leprechaun, but is there really much of a difference at this point? I would have to imagine that if you're watching this video, you have at least a basic understanding of what leprechauns are, which is essentially angry little Irish people who have pots of gold hidden at the end of rainbows and use magic to harass the humans they come into contact with. There's also a legend that says if you catch one, you either get some of their gold for yourself or three wishes, but sometimes you've got to do some convincing. Now personally, and maybe you're with me on this, I've never really thought that much about leprechauns. They were just something I learned about as a kid and grew accustomed to seeing during St. Patty celebrations and Lucky Charms commercials. I never questioned how straight up weird these guys are until recently. I got an invitation to a bar crawl that, like most things this month, ended up being canceled on account of the whole global pandemic thing, and there was a little leprechaun sitting in the top right corner of the page, and when I looked at it, I couldn't help but think, what the hell is that thing? So I did some digging, and as it turns out, nobody really knows for sure. But there is some fascinating theories out there, as well as a ton of leprechaun lore that I'd never heard before, like the fact that there is more than one kind of leprechaun, and their appearance depends on where in Ireland you find them. Some interesting shit, right? And I see no reason to put it off any longer. So ladies and gentlemen, make sure you hit that like button and subscribe if you haven't already. These are the messed up origins of the leprechaun. So I think the first thing we need to establish before going too deep is what a leprechaun actually is. As mentioned before, there's a few basic details that everyone knows. Leprechauns are magic little men who like to play tricks on people and have a stash of gold hidden at the end of rainbows. But that's really just a caricature of what leprechauns truly are, and that's dangerous territorial creatures who don't want to be messed with. Now let's start from the top with a common misconception. According to my math, in roughly 98.7% of scenarios, leprechauns are shown wearing green, but in actuality, they were red, at least most of the time. According to William Butler Yeats, an Irish poet who's considered a pillar of the Irish literary establishment, that's because leprechauns are solitary fairies, and solitary fairies wear red, while fairies that live in groups wear green. And depending on what part of Ireland a leprechaun hails from, he could be wearing a number of different outfits or even be called something entirely different. The following information comes from an Irish author named David Russell McAnally. And the only reason I'm restraining myself from making jokes about that is because I have a feeling I'm pronouncing it wrong. He describes four variations of the leprechaun. The Logriman is found in the northern counties of Ireland. He wears a red coat and white pants that resemble the outfits worn by British infantry, as well as a broad-brimmed, high-pointed hat. The Larigadon lurks in Tipperary. He also sports a red jacket, but wears a jockey cap as well, and has a sword that he uses as a magic wand. The Loricon can be found in Kerry. He's described as a fat little fella whose face is about as red as his jacket, which has seven rows with seven buttons each, though it's never actually buttoned. He either wears a helmet that's several sizes too big for him or ties a handkerchief around his head. In Monaghan resides the Chloricon. He wears a fancy red dress coat with a green vest underneath, as well as white pants, black stockings, and shiny black shoes. His hat is a long comb without a brim that usually sits crooked on his head of curly hair. So as you can see, the biggest differences seem to be the styles of coats and hats they wear. When it comes to their personalities, leprechauns are pretty consistent. With the exception of the Chloricon, which is also known for getting drunk in taverns, they all seem to prefer being alone and spend their time either making or mending shoes. An interesting fact I found was that the Oxford Dictionary actually lists the phrase Leith Brogan, which means shoemaker, as a possible origin of the word leprechaun. Another possibility is Lucrepan, which means small body. If you're wondering why they spend all their time alone, there's a pretty funny explanation for it. Some say the leprechaun is actually an old bachelor elf who somehow fended off his mother's attempts to marry him to a pretty young thing and was exiled willingly as a result of refusing to conform. So what we can gather from that is that leprechauns might be a subsect of a broader species that actually does have a society of its own but more on that later. Now, as you might expect from ancient creatures who've spent their entire lives alone, leprechauns can be very territorial. Most of the time, their homes have hidden entrances by caves, rabbit holes, hollowed out tree trunks, essentially things that you aren't likely to notice, and even if you did, you wouldn't think too much of them. But if you do happen to notice and get curious, you better watch yourself, because leprechauns are not the type to ask questions. They'll either attack you right on the spot or take note of who you are and proceed to make your life hell. They'll steal food, turn up the heat on the stove so your pots spoil over, throw furniture, throw your baby. Let me say that one more time. They will throw your baby without even asking permission. Like how rude is that? Ask. 
ask before you throw my baby. And even worse than that, if you really piss them off, they'll go as far as to kidnap your baby and replace them with a fairy lookalike called a changeling. You might remember me mentioning changelings in my episode about the girl without hands. Oh, and by the way, if you ever catch your dog sitting around all dirty and exhausted, it's probably because a leprechaun took him out for a spin. They tend to do that with dogs, goats, and sheep. That might also be why Gunther looks like this right now. Another interesting fact I learned is that leprechauns hate schools, possibly because educated folks like professors and headmasters refuse to believe in them. You might think that means leprechauns are terrorizing schools all over Ireland to convince the faculty of their existence, but it's surprisingly the exact opposite. They avoid them, and whenever a new school is established in town, all the leprechauns leave. So at this point, you might be thinking that leprechauns sound like pretty annoying creatures, and you would be right about that. But as I mentioned earlier, catching one can result in a hefty reward. Experts say the best way of doing this is to go to isolated areas around Ireland and listen for the sound of them making shoes because when they're focused, it's more likely that you can sneak up on them. If you manage to get within arm's reach, you can either catch them in a net or put them in a chokehold. It's totally up to you. And the little weirdo will offer you a variety of sweet prizes in exchange for his freedom. You could get some wishes, his pot of gold, or take from his personal stash that he has on him. You need to be careful though because even at his most vulnerable, a leprechaun is cunning and will try to find a way to escape. This might entail physically assaulting you or distracting you with a magic magic pouch that contains a charmed coin that always appears back inside it. So while you're busy counting your loot, he can escape. And to those wondering why leprechauns even have pots of gold in the first place, those are supposedly from wartime. Legend says the Danes, who once conquered Ireland, buried pots of gold around the country and entrusted them to leprechauns for safekeeping. Now that basically covers all the major aspects of leprechaun lore, but this wouldn't be messed up origins unless we took a look at where the little buggers actually came from. So let's jump into that next. So as I mentioned earlier, no one really knows where the concept of leprechauns came from. And for me personally, that's not too surprising. I've covered almost a hundred stories at this point, and they've included a huge variety of fantastic creatures, witches, goblins, trolls, centaurs, you name it. And we don't know what inspired the vast majority of them. However, that hasn't stopped experts from taking a crack at it. One of the leading theories is that leprechauns are part of the, I believe it's pronounced East She family of fairies that exists within Irish mythology. I do want to make clear that leprechauns themselves don't appear in any of the ancient Irish myths and instead were introduced through folk tales. But in this case, the folk tales borrowed from the universe that was created through the myths. So in that way, they're connected. It's kind of like if someone in 1500s Greece thought up a new species that was somehow a descendant of the Olympians that were worshiped thousands of years prior. It wouldn't be part of the original Greek mythos, but it would have its roots in it. Does that make sense? Now the East Shi are said to be either the ancestors of humans, the spirits of nature, or gods and goddesses. They're also referred to as the later literary versions of the Tuatha de Danann, aka the tribe of the gods, aka the main deities of Ireland before the country adopted Christianity. The belief was that the East Shi lived in a secret society, either deep underground or in a parallel dimension where they could walk among the humans without being seen. Kind of like how they do it in the Beyond This Earthly Realm episode of Adventure Time. Also, people generally feared the East Shi and made sacrifices to them on a regular basis to stay on their good side. They even avoided calling them by name, either opting for the good neighbors or the fair folk. So the East Shi were living large for a while, but legend says when the new religions moved in and the worshippers began to convert, they lost some of their powers, shrunk down, and became leprechauns. What a bummer that would be, huh? To go from a god or goddess to a leprechaun? I honestly don't blame them for spending so much time harassing humans anymore. It's pretty much all our fault they lost their ethereal clout. If you were to look up the first time the word leprechaun, or a form of it, was used in a story, you would be pointed to a play written by Thomas Decker in 1604 called The New Whore. Part two. The word is only said once, and the line goes as follows. As for your Irish lubricant, that spirit whom by preposterous charms thy lust hath raised in wrong circle. No, I don't know what it means either, but I do dig the name of the play. Now, if you were to ask what the first story that leprechauns appeared in was, you would be told Fergus MacLetty, or in English, that's Adventure of Fergus, Son of Letty, which is thought to have been written back in the eighth century and is very fucking weird. It opens with the conclusion of a great war, and our hero, King Fergus, has returned to his homeland of Ulster. Now, 
Now that he's finally done with those pesky battles and chopping off his enemies' heads, the king wants to relax and takes his slave girl to the beach where they both fall asleep on the shore. But sometime later, Fergus wakes up to find himself being pulled into the ocean by three magic dwarves who aren't specifically called leprechauns but embody all of their traits. As soon as his feet touched the water, Fergus jumped up and caught hold of all three little men and their leader said he'd grant them a wish if he let them go. So the king agreed and wished for a charm that would let him breathe underwater. The leprechaun leader said he would grant his wish, but under the condition that he would never go into Dundrum Bay. Fergus agreed to this and was then given either some magic herbs to put in his ears or a cloak to wrap around his head, depending on the version. And then, in a truly bizarre twist, the leprechaun started to suck on the king's breasts. Seriously, he did that. And it even weirded out the king who was like, why are you doing that? And the leprechaun replied that it was how his people asked for pity. Not gonna lie, I don't think it gets more pitiful than a grown man voluntarily sucking on another man's pecs so he doesn't kill him. That's... That's bottom feeder shit right there. Anyway, the rest of the story actually doesn't involve the leprechauns at all, so I'll give you the too long, didn't read version. Essentially what happens is the king goes into the bay that he promised he wouldn't and discovers a horrible monster there called the Murdress, a mysterious undefined horror that has the appearance of a thorn bush, stings at the touch, and inflates and deflates as it breathes. Simply laying eyes on the Murdress can kill you, but Fergus gets off kinda lucky. His mouth just twists to the back of his head. Hey, I said kinda lucky. Now obviously this is a horrible deformity, but somehow Fergus's servants kept it a secret from him for seven whole years. It wasn't until a slave girl that Fergus whipped got angry and insulted him for it that he realized something was wrong. And by the way, that slave, he cut her in half. Thought you should know. Next, Fergus returns to Dundrum Bay to take his revenge on the monster. And after an entire day of battling, which left the bay dyed red with blood, he returned to the shore with its head in his hands, declared himself the victor, and died immediately after. Quite the dramatic ending for a story that features a magical little person trying to breastfeed from another man, wouldn't you say? Well, as odd as that story was, it's what we're ending our episode with today. Thanks for watching, everybody. I'm curious, though, now that we've gone over all that leprechaun lore, where they may have come from, and now that story, what are your thoughts? Did this change the way you'll think of leprechauns when you see them in the future? Or did I just give you some ammo for the arsenal of fun facts you're gonna unload at this weekend's quarantine party? Let me know in the comments down below. And while you're doing that, let me tell you about this week's sponsor, Raycon. If you spend a lot of time on YouTube, then you've probably already heard of Raycon and their incredible wireless earbuds, and there's good reason for it. Not only are they half the price of competing brands, but they somehow manage that without sacrificing any quality. The Bluetooth connectivity is simple to set up and works like a charm. Their audio drivers are of the highest quality, and they're resistant to sweat and water, which I think is my favorite feature because I can wear them in the hot tub and sauna without being paranoid that they're going to get damaged. And personally, I think their newest model, the Everyday E25s, are the best ones yet. In addition to all of those features I just mentioned, they also have an impressive battery life with six hours of playtime, and their charging case can store up to four full charges. Raycons are both stylish and discreet with no dangling wires or stems, while still giving you that noise-isolating fit you want, and you have the option of picking out the color that suits you best. I chose black to match my soul. If you want to join me in owning some of the best wireless earbuds on the market and don't want to break your bank to do it, just go to buyraycon.com slash johnsolo or click my link in the description to get 15% off your order. Wasn't that fun? Anyway, Solo fam, it's time we wrap this video up. As always, make sure you drop a like if you enjoyed it, subscribe if you haven't already, and share this with anyone you know who either really likes leprechauns or is really friggin' Irish. Links to my social medias are also down below. Give those a like or follow if you wanna stay updated on channel news, what I'm up to between videos, or if you just wanna say hey and throw a suggestion my way. Then, when you finish following me on everything, make sure you follow Gunther, because why wouldn't you? He's just majestic. Thanks again for watching, everybody. I'll see you next time with even more messed up origins. Until then, my name is John Solo, and remember, John shot first.